I think it's always relevant, but mm, yes. I feel like at the moment, and maybe this is why I thought of it, number one, it's been a topic that we wanted to talk about for a while. And I guess the second, I've been out and about so much more the last couple of months and speaking to so many different levels of human beings, I guess you could say, and they're all very different in the way that they conduct themselves. And I guess that does come down to emotional intelligence and what makes a good leader um, and what makes a good employee and employer. And I think that emotional intelligence really, it comes down to that at the end of the day. Mm. And um, yeah, it's it's an interesting topic that I, um, I'd learned about. And yeah, we just thought, what a good platform to talk about it. Yeah. And we're going into that phase now where it's end of the financial year. I'm actually, I just said to Taylor this morning, I'm tired. Um, <clears throat> and we're halfway through the year. Well, it's end of month five, but it's been a busy first five months. Um, and I think people are getting to that phase now where it's okay contracts are coming to an end are we being renewed what does that look like what decisions do i have to make um and all like Bella said this emotional intelligence the ei side um it all just it permeates into everything you do yeah. um everything interaction with colleagues family um how you conduct yourself in an interview what do you put on your resume? Um, how do you conduct yourself in your first week of work, your second week of work when you're starting a new role? So it's um, it's something that we almost take for granted, but it's really sometimes it's just good to stop a bit. Like Tyler said, I actually had an idea of what it was and then did some research and like, oh, actually this is, it's so much bigger. It literally touches everything we do. Yeah, and for me, True, I didn't realize that there's actually five main concepts of emotional intelligence and it's self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills. I had no idea that that was all in the big AI um, frame. Mm. So, and that's been really interesting to deep dive into all of them a little bit further, which we'll do today. But um, it's really only been popularized since 1995, which I thought was really interesting right. as well. Yeah. Because there was a book that came out um, called Emotional Intelligence Why It Can Matter More Than IQ, which, like, that's to me, um, everything was about IQ, like how smart you are, all of that. But now, bringing it back one step, it's all about how can you self-aware and self-regulate your emotions in the workplace but also having that motivation and empathy as a leader but also that social skill which come into every single aspect so I thought that was really interesting so that book's by Dr Daniel Goleman so I reckon that will be my next audio book that I'll listen to so I'll keep you posted on that one it's amazing how it's only 1995 yeah like that's what 30 years ago less than yeah 20. less than 20 like that's insane mm -hmm. to think that we haven't thought about um and actually the leaps and bounds that that's happened from 1995 to where we are now and I'm sure there was talks and it was around obviously before then it's just been popularized a little mm -hmm. bit more since then um we've had like we literally had a client last week come out with a role for a second time and when we asked them what what was missing from the first time the role came out to market um they immediately said they went to behavioral based interview they do behavioral based interviews um and people just don't necessarily sell themselves into a role enough and it's it's part of that little bit of self-awareness and being able to understand what it is that the audience is seeking and how do you sell yourself towards that position um and a lot of us don't like talking about me i how great i am 
but that awareness of what was your role within a project that you did to help that project get across the line. I think all of that is a little bit of emotional intelligence. Like yeah. how do you bring that into an interview without saying that I was the best thing since sliced toast, but mm -hmm. um, I am really good and I can yeah. do it for you. Also, for some people, it's a little bit taboo to mm. let people know how good you are and mm. tell people how good you are as well because of the way that they brought up or the generation that they grew up in with their families and all of that. So, yeah, it is sort of understanding the importance of why you're doing it and you're not doing it to make yourself be the best of the best, but you're there to make yourself the best in that job that you can so yeah. i think too yeah that's that self-awareness mm -hmm. as well yeah and it goes both ways like when you start a new position we spoke about that this morning as well mm -hmm. you start a new position and you have an idea of what this position is and the people that hired you the hiring manager has an idea of what this position should be mm. and potentially there could be a little bit of a disconnect in terms of your understanding and their expectation and to go sit down and say okay i'm here this is day three i've been onboarded i've gotten my head around things a little bit i know for contracting it has to happen very quickly permanent you have an opportunity maybe to ease in a little bit but at some stage you've got to go okay so where am I adding the value? How am I, what is what is my little puzzle piece I need to fit in for you, Mr. or Mrs. Hiring Manager, so that this picture that you're creating, that I can be part of creating that picture for you. Um, and again, that's just being um, confident enough and self-aware mm -hmm. enough to go, I'm not 100% sure if this is what I thought it is, can I double check that with you? Is this what I'm thinking? Do I fit in here? Um, and bringing some value, yeah. bringing the value to an organization um, once you have secured a position. We've had positions where candidates have come to us and said, well, I've just started this new job. I was in the job for a week and then realized. It's not what they said it's it was. Not, it's not what they said it was. Um, yeah. And that takes, it takes gut to then go, you know what? I'm not going to stay in this position and do myself an injustice by doing a role that I'm not enjoying. But also the flip side, I'm not the person that should be doing this job for you. It should be somebody else. Um, and sometimes clients don't realize it until they found the wrong person in that position. Yeah. Um, that's a tough call to make um, because it's a salary and its experience and how do you explain the fact that you've moved on after two Certainly. months or a month yeah that's that's a tough one but we can work around that it's 100 work aroundable yeah and i think in those situations there's usually a genuine reason mm. why correct um obviously some that there's not but usually there's a genuine reason why that has happened and that could have been maybe being self-aware of your weaknesses that you didn't know was a weakness yeah. or a strength that you didn't know was a strength that wasn't aligned with sort of your values or um, what motivates you or all of that. So all of that still comes under that banner. So like owning your emotions, strengths, weaknesses, values yeah. and what motivates you. So that's a, it's a lot that people have to make sure that it ticks every box to be that right fit for the right role. And like you said, sometimes you don't know until you're actually in there and you're you're doing the things and it's it's not adding up. It doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. When you speak about values, that's a really interesting um a very interesting topic for me. Um I only probably about eight years ago really sat down and figured out what are my values. Mm -hmm. I knew that I have values and I knew that when things, you know, they, they contrast with my values, but what were my top three values? I actually did a three-day workshop 
wow. about values and what are the values and what's really, really important for you. And if you have to choose your top three values, what are those and why are they? And so many things, maybe later in my life, but so many things became clear to me where I was like, oh, I understand why I reacted that way in that situation because it didn't feel right. But ultimately it was because my values did not align and other situations where you're like, yep, this works perfectly, we're aligned, we're in sync with each other. And you don't always have the luxury to do that in an organization. There are places where you're working and values might not align because you've got different people, different organizations, different cultures, diff everything is is trying to work towards one common goal. And that's where that empathy comes in. Mm. But you need to be very clear on how much you're willing to bend. Yeah. Because you can bend a bit, but there comes a point where the bending is at the cost of your values. Exactly. And yeah. And that could be a it's a a small line that you could cross. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to take on other people's emotions and other people's things on board. I know myself, I'm very much an empath but I tend to take other people's stuff on and I've actually learned to build a wall and be like yeah I can still be empathetic but still keep my wall up and not let that physically and emotionally hurt me yeah. or make me sad or like the other morning I was mm -hmm. visiting my mum at Rivey and I had to drop my partner off at the airport so it was like we were there at the crack of dawn and I literally just went okay, it's 5.30, it's probably a little bit too early to knock on her door um, to say I'm here. But so I ended up going down to the beach and I heard this gentleman singing down at the beach and I'm like, oh, okay, sure, whatever. Um, and then he came up and he, he came straight to me and said, oh, excuse me, do you mind if I sit next to you? And I'm like, oh, sure, go right ahead. And he literally needed somebody to to talk to and I was that person and he said thank you so much his best friend died that night and I was like whoa okay like that's that's heavy and that is something that I would normally take on and feel sad for the rest of the day because he was so emotional like it was his best friend for 20 years and he he just needed somebody to talk to but in that split second I was like okay I'm taking this on like I could like I was getting teary and I'm like okay I've got to like be empathetic towards him which I was but I as soon as I leave this park bench I can't take that with me yeah and no like the, and then like so that's the skill that you have to learn as a leader i think mm -hmm. but even just as a human because mm -hmm. you do come through so many different stages in your life where you do have to be empathetic to people but you can't take it on yeah mm. that's a huge yeah that's a big that's a very big one it's a, and it's a big lesson to learn i think as a leader remember when we spoke to june um, about leadership and just how she manages her team. And there's a lot of empathy in that. Mm -hmm. But I also think it's empathy, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and then going, okay, I'm stepping out of those shoes now. I'm stepping back into my shoes because there has to be a barrier. Yeah. Um, you can help without um, putting yourself in that same position um, and you do need that you do need to be able to empath empathize be able to step into that position but then be able to step out of it as well because you yeah. do have a team of other people yeah that need your assistance in different different levels i do think as an as an empath and as maybe as, as introverts as well that's exhausting yeah that takes a lot out of someone. So also being conscious of that, that self-awareness for yourself to go, yeah. okay, I just need a break. Um, yeah. I and self-regulate. Yes. Yeah, which is another one, again, within emotional intelligence, self-regulating. So that's like another big thing that I think everybody has to learn. And mm -hmm. there's certain techniques that work 
with different people like meditation or mindfulness or deep breathing pausing and reflecting or even if it's a workout or a walk or something to just kind of be like okay I'm aware that this emotion is here how do I manage it Mm. so Mm. and that's huge in leadership too so Mm. as if a leader can't self-regulate or if they're known for having like a quick temper or impulsive decisions that massively impacts the behavior of their team because their behavior of the team is going to match what that leader is doing so it's going to be chaotic yeah there's going to be things happening left right and center and impulse decisions getting made here and there that aren't necessarily right because the leader is quick tempered and just can't self-regulate exactly so i think being able to sit back pause reflect and then make that decision that whole team is gonna calm down and make better decisions and be a nicer workplace Mm. to be in well even if you're an employee and you're part of a team and (laughs) excuse me you've got a quick um quick temper or you're reactive your your Mm. um go-to is to be reactive um that's a personality trait to be aware of and in certain situations i think it's good if you can throw out ideas and be part and be reactive sometimes it's not if you can be aware of that but then the leader also needs to be aware of the fact that they have somebody in their team and it's Again, self-awareness, to be able to self-regulate, just knowing yourself and taking ownership of of that. Um, This is a huge topic. This is not just five points. I was just going to say, it's interesting that you're saying that it's only happened in the 90s. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. Because those words that you're using have always been there. But I think there's been a massive shift from oh, but this happens in personal lives. This doesn't happen at work. Work. But if, but as we know, post-COVID um, and, you know, when you had that conversation with June a while ago, we were talking about people as a package. package. Oh, and not yes. just June, but also with Wilmy, we're talking about, you know, your personal lives do come to work, whether you would like them to or not. Yep. Um, and, you know, some people will have different challenges with, uh, regulation and things like that due yep. to not just their personal upbringing but maybe they're neurodiverse as well yep. correct um, but yeah it's a huge 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 yeah topic. yeah um, mm. industrial it's- psychology is also i've just started seeing that everywhere a lot so mm. i think there is that move potentially towards understanding that we need to take emotions and skills into play more so at work than what we did previously to be able to work with all the humans that we come across in our yeah in our work lives and we've 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 seen as well where clients are saying that they are skills are really really important and experience in terms of the technical side that you bring to the table but there's also those soft skills, those behavioral yep. side. And clients look for that because they realize that you might have a candidate that has 90% of the skills, but a great attitude, just self-awareness can take, um, uh, can auto-regulate, can yep. be part of it. So that, the 10% that you're missing on taking a 100% technical person, maybe take the technical person that's 90% there, but is a great team person, that 10% makes up for it very, very quickly. The yeah. flip side we've seen as well, where you do hire for skill and you do not take the people soft skills in consideration, that could be the entrepreneur detrimental to a team and an organization so they all go hand in hand and like you said gnomes i think it's always been around it maybe just been labeled Mm. like it's been given a name or it's been identified as this is it um so yeah it's a huge topic and we can actually i think motivation oh my god (laughs) that's huge How many episodes do we have? Yeah, huge. So we could potentially speak about, you know, each of the five sections that make up 
um, emotional intelligence yeah. <clears throat> and how important that is to get that across in an interview, how to ask questions, um, to be aware that, hang on, I'm not 100% sure how I'm adding value here. Mm -hmm. I, I usually do this, but I can't within this environment. How can I add value? Have the conversation. Yeah. Have the confidence to have the conversation. So how do I add value in this? Yeah. I'm not 100% sure. And yeah, that's even a question in an interview. What, what does success look like for this position in the first month? In yep. the first three months, what what would you define yep. as success? So that you know, yes, that relates to my skills and experience that I can bring to the table. So yes, absolutely. In the first three months, I I'm I will be on par with what you want this position to look like in three months to be successful. So there's a whole bunch of how tos. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, that can definitely help. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, and I'm glad that you brought it up. I think. Being highly aware of your um, emotional intelligence does give you more confidence as well mm. because you know exactly what you're capable of and if something triggers you, you know that that's not going to affect you as well. So I think, yeah, having that confidence and emotional intelligence does come hand in hand. And yeah. sometimes, and it, sorry, Naomi, sometimes you have to say no. No, that's yeah. not for me. Again, boundaries. Yep, and that's all okay. Boundaries, confidence, emotional yep. intelligence, mental yep. health. I think it's a whole big banner, which is spoken about more openly today. And I think that's why emotional intelligence is so big at work because you can bring your emotions. Having your emotions is actually good mm. if you can do it in the right way yeah. because we're not robots and we're mm. not all the same person. And that's how... The dynamics of teams work like you play off each other and personalities and that's how you can make magic or it's Correct. how you can absolutely get it wrong yeah it's Correct. why team building is so important mm -hmm. and understanding how to put together a team yep. is so important right. but then on the flip side there's also great opportunities for growth like yeah uh, there's so much that you can do you can go to psychologists and you can work on yourself whether it be your self-awareness your communication skills understanding barriers to why you don't feel comfortable selling mm. yourself mm. or you know talking about yourself and things like that if you um are neurodiverse and you're having challenges but you want to try and overcome those challenges you can see occupational therapists and I think as time goes on, especially um, for people trying to get into the workforce, I'm sort of seeing that those roles are coming out. They are they are becoming more prominent to help mm. people lead purposeful lives. So the motivation and the want is there. Yeah. It's often the, the knowledge or we lack the knowledge and how do we implement it into everyday life or how do we how do we make this work at work? Mm. Correct. And uh, we play a little part in that, you know, mm. because when we um, when we recruit for a position, we would know eight out of ten wh what the client looks for, what the team looks like, what kind of person. So the conversations we have is very much this is what it is, this is what it looks like. Is this you? Yeah, and the, the, question, the answer is either yes, that sounds amazing, or no, that's definitely not me. And both those are the right answer. Yeah. If that's what fits for you. So that's where we come in. Is that not just can you can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this in terms of technical skills? Yep, you've ticked that box. Now let me tell you about the environment. Let me tell you about the project. We had a project last year where it was until the end of the year, and it potentially could be a two-year contract after that, or it ended. And we wouldn't know that up until probably mid-December. So we had to get the right people in that project that was they were happy to take the risk, be comfortable with the fact that I'm either not going to have a job at the end of December or I'm going to be with this organization for another two years. And either way, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. That doesn't sit well with everybody. And yeah. that is okay because that's that's our job our job is to make sure that that's it's okay with you and to be transparent to give you the good the bad the ugly the everything in between so that when you step into that interview 
you're not blindsided by anything. When you step into your first week, you know more or less what's going on. You can find your feet. Yes, we don't know everything, but we can set the stage and try and give you an understanding of what it looks like so that you're empowered to make a decision about what's right for you. Mm -hmm. And not just money and not just skill. 100%. And I, I'm working with a client at the moment who is very much just looking for that right fit. Like skills are important, yes, but they're probably 40%. They they said we can teach these things. We're just looking for that right person. And it is quite a niche market that they'll be working in. It's a tough role. It's a niche market and it's not for everyone. And I spoke to somebody the other day and he's like oh look I'm not sure if I want to go into that market and it's like that's that's totally okay yep and that's fine and that's now I know that that's probably not a market that he wants to go into then now I know that we need to sort of focus on maybe finding him something else that's not in that so yeah I think the, especially with the client who I'm working with they're very much like people focus they can teach skills they can't teach who that yeah. person is correct yeah. yes. and they're very like it's a quite a small team as well so they don't want to put the wrong person in person. they need that right person which i love they one line that they said to me and mm-hmm. you don't hear it very often coming from hiring managers and it was we hire for the future like we yeah. hire on what people can do we don't hire with exactly what they can do. We hire for potential. Love that. And I'm like, oh, my God, that is music to my ear. Mm, Not very cool. often you get a hiring manager say that they're hiring for potential. Yeah. That's so amazing. that meant to me, all right, you're looking for the right, we need to find you the right fit, not necessarily the skills, but the fit. Yeah. And that's our job. That's yeah. where we fit in and that's how we can either get you your perfect position, yeah. perfect, mm. <clears throat> or keep looking until we find that perfect position. Yeah. yeah. And touching on the last point and sort of bringing that all together, which is your motivation. So we also need to find out how these guys are motivated. Mm. Are they motivated like extrinsic, like driven by external rewards, like money or recognition? So we wouldn't want to put this person well, we wouldn't tell this person that is motivated by money that there's massive bonuses and there's this and there's that and there's this, but there's none of that just to get them across the line. So also we need to find people how they're motivated. Like if you're um, motivated by like personal satisfaction and your passion for work, well, then maybe a company that doesn't work on like a, a bonus structure could be better for you than a company that does work on a bonus kpi structure because that's like yeah so that different motivation as well is how we have to place the right person or find that right person and it ultimately comes back to understanding who you are and what's important to you like Mm -hmm. we can't tell you what's important to you we can tell you what the role's like and then we can talk about what's important to you but you need to understand that first Mm. what is important to you what are your values what are your non-negotiables and what's the focus and life goes through cycles like Mm. you might be in a cycle where money is the most important thing and that's a hundred percent fine so Mm -hmm. we'll look for a contract role where we can get you as much money as possible and in a year's time or in six months time that might change to go well i'm now ready to work walk into an environment where I can add value and I can, um, you know, be part of a team and it's not project work. So yeah, just understanding where you are in your cycle in terms of what is important, what do you need? Mm. Because that empowers us then to go find the right thing or to connect you with the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. 